trying to organize by College Union 22 at Calicut Medical College. I'm Maitri Varya, and I'm, I'll be your moderator for today. Today, MedMed 2.0 is an international medical college where eminent faculties from all across the world have converged to provide a platform for medical students, UG students, young doctors, and academics to reach greater heights within the vast expanse of the medical field. The MedMed conference, as I said, is being conducted by College Union 2022 in association with Doc Tutorials. With that in mind, I feel honored to welcome the brilliant Dr. Vandana Puri, MD, M DNB, MNAMS Pathology from the Department of Pathology at Lady Hardinge Medical College in New Delhi. Ma'am, with her many accolades, has always tried to share her knowledge and insights and contribute to the medical education worldwide. Ma'am shall be joining us today to take the session on hemogram interpretation. Thank you for joining, ma'am, and please continue and please take your session. Thank you so much, dear. Uh, I know. Uh, so this is one of the very uh, very uh, difficult topics which I uh, always feel undergraduates always says, ma'am. Uh, we don't know how to interpret the hemograms. They are so simple and they are routinely available. So we are not living in a primitive era where you know, uh, the, where we had to count all the cells manually. Now we have such beautiful automatic cell counters, which give us the report. But interpretation of the hemograms is must for every intern and an undergraduate. And this is a very, very important part of your medical training. So guys, today I'll be talking just very basic interpretation of hemograms, which you all should be knowing. Okay. So uh, before we go to uh, 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 hemogram, we should all know that we have everything now. Uh, when we talk about complete blood counts, they can be counted by automated hematology analysis. And what is the advantage? Why do you use that? Why don't you count it manually? Because they are accurate, they are precise, they are very fast. And you can get so many uh, values at the same time. And there is a lot of reduction of the labor. And, you know, you can identify a lot of red cell indices which help you identify many hemoglobinopathies which are present. And what are the disadvantages? So disadvantage means there is flagging which is going to occur. You know, machine is a machine. So it, when it is not able to identify something or distinguish between two cells, it will give you a flag. Flag always means you have to again go and see your manual smears again. And it doesn't tell you about morphology. Obviously, the bread and butter of a pathologist is morphology. Okay, you have to see the slide, which your counters are not going to tell you okay also you know if suppose platelets get clumped together okay so we will see later that the counters are very basically they are these things which identify the size so if they are counting a red cell of this size and a platelet is clumped and it will also form this size so they will start counting the platelet clumps as rbcs and it will be counted as a single cell so you are going to get an automatic false low counts and that is why you would see in many patients will they will have thrombocytopenia on counters and you'll be running your seniors will be telling you go and get the smears examined there might be platelet clumps so every platelet clump, clump has to be seen manually okay under the microscope and obviously it is expensive and it has high running costs now, the uh, values or parameters which an every undergraduate knows is that we see RBC, WBC and platelet on the counter. But we should also know that apart from these three basic counters, we have lot of other parameters which can be given by the counters and need to be known. So this <clears throat> was a person called Valis Coulter who basically designed a simple simple machine saying that okay if a blood cell is passing through the aperture we can measure it so the principle was called electrical impedance okay what was electrical impedance see whenever any cell is passing through the aperture so if that cell when it passes through the aperture the number of time it will pass it will give you the number of cells. So suppose, let's say, the platelet count is 1 lakh. How do you get a 1 lakh count? Because 1 lakh time, that pulse cell cells are passing through that aperture and it will give you the number. What about the height of the pulse? That, that cell will also create a height. 
that height is equivalent to the volume of the cells and obviously this is how the electrical impedance basically is used to identify the parameters okay now these oscillations which are coming you know height and number they are arranged according to the volume interval and it gives you a histogram which is very mandatory to be known so if we talk about this what we have learned we have learned that every cell passes through the aperture and the number of time it is passing through the aperture it is giving you the uh, number of cells and the uh, height of that pulse that is created will give you the volume and when you count when you put them together you create a histogram so therefore electrical impedance which i am telling you this mechanism can be used Uh, to to find out countable uh, parameters so what can you count you can count wbcs you can count rbcs and you can count platelets as they pass through the aperture okay so what do you do is you take the sample so when which uh, who will tell me the answer to this question which vacutainer should you use for complete blood count counting who will tell me the answer to this question so i'm waiting for the uh, for the audience to answer in the comments it has to be taken by taken in edt okay and which edt so remember always it's preferable is di potassium edt which we use okay because it's in the form of powder we can use tri potassium also but it is basically liquid form so it alters the volume so we don't prefer that so therefore di potassium edt is the preferred anticoagulant in which you should take the blood now once you take the blood whole of the blood is aspirated by the machine and then it is divided into two samples so the first sample basically is used to identify the countable parameters what were the countable parameters the rbcs and the platelet and the second sample is used to count wbc and hemogram now you should ask me ma'am why this division why it does uh, the machine does so you know it's very very simple because there are three detector blocks in the counter so what you do is when you uh, aspirate the blood this blood is immediately mixed with stromatolyzer and this stromatolyzer lyses all the rbcs so now once the rbcs are lysed what are you left with you left with, you are left basically uh, you can uh, be you left with uh, i'm sorry for in the interruption ma'am the slides are not changing just a second let me see uh let's project again and just tell me if they change now all right ma'am okay yeah is it okay uh can you change the slide once ma'am yeah and just see if it is changing no uh it's not it's changing it's not ma'am it's not it's not changing why why okay let me see uh ma'am did you put it in the slide show yeah i did let's like, see uh, uh ma'am if we, we are putting in the slide show it might not be appearing in the uh, while we are streaming like for in the google meet while we are presenting the screen so could you present without slide uh, without the slide share i mean okay. without the uh Now, now. Yes, ma'am. And uh, and just move the pages like up and down. Okay. And uh, now it's changing, ma'am. Like I, uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, so do it like this. I can't do it in the slideshow mode. Yeah, the slideshow won't be uh, won't be showed in the presentation in the Google Meet. Okay. So is it is it okay if I do like this then? Y yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh. So is it coming correctly? Yeah, the it's the principle of automated hematol generalizer. Yeah, you you can okay. basically see me. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. You can continue. Okay. Right. So I'm not going to slide show more then. Okay. 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 So uh, so what do we do is we as soon as we aspirate the blood, guys. So blood is immediately mixed with the stromatolyzer solution. This stromatolyzer is a solution which is going to lyse all the RBCs. So now once the RBCs are lysed, we are left with WBCs, which can be counted in the WBC detector blot. And because the RBCs have lysed, so what will come out from that RBCs? 
hemoglobin. So this hemoglobin can be measured by non-cyanide hemoglobin method. So we are going to count the hemoglobin in it. So that is why I told you that we count the WBCs and hemoglobin together. Okay, so we are going to count both WBCs and hemoglobin together. Whereas we are going to count RBCs and platelets together. Okay, so together means we have an RBC detector uh, block in which the RBCs and platelets are counted together. So if you look at the counter, this is how your counter basically appears. This is called three-part counters, okay? So we start with the most basic counter. These are three-part counters, which gives you, uh, you know, three parts. Three parts means three types of cells. We'll be just talking on the basis of WBCs, okay? So this is called three-part counter, which was very traditionally used. And can you see here, guys, there is a stromatolyzer solution. I hope you understand what is stromatolyzer now. It's basically going to glyce all the RBCs and what you left with is WBCs, okay? So now, once we are clear with this, we should, now we have understood that RBCs and platelets are counted together. So now the next question that should come into your mind is that, ma'am, when RBCs and platelets are counted together, how does the machine separate them? So it's a very, very simple point you should remember that any particle between 2 to 20 femtoliter okay so any particle which is of the size between 2 to 20 femtoliter your machine counts them as platelets whereas any particle which is greater than 30 femtoliter is counted as rbcs so it's the size which defines so something which is smaller than 20 femtoliter has to be platelet something which is bigger than 20 femtoliter okay is basically your uh, RBCs. Okay, so nothing should be smaller than 2 femtoliters. You should remember that. So the cutoff is 2 to 20 femtoliters. Now, once we're clear with this, all of you know that what happens in WBC uh, chamber, we basically add the stromatolyzer and stromatolyzer basically breaks all the RBCs and you're left with your WBCs. Now, here is a very important point you should remember that this lysing reagent also causes breakdown of the WBC membrane. So, basically, coulter or counters basically just measure the nuclear size of the WBCs, okay? So, you have to remember that, okay? So, they just see the nuclear size and that is how we divide them also. We will be coming to that later. And also, I have already told you that all the lysed solution, we take it for use counting the hemoglobin for estimating the hemoglobin okay by non-cyanide hemoglobin method so here you should remember that this is called cyanide free hemoglobin chemistry by which the hemoglobin is estimated and what do you do is here because there is rbc lysis okay and there uh, we add the hemo cyanide free uh, hemoglobin method and the uh, the uh, compound that is created as sodium laurel sulfate with hemoglobin complex and its absorption peak is at 555 nanometer and we count them now once we are very very clear with this there is another principle that you have to remember here is hydrodynamic focusing what do you mean by hydrodynamic focusing in the machine you know it is very mandatory that the cells pass in single line okay so otherwise what is going to happen it is like a traffic jam okay so if everybody starts going at the same time the the counter will get confused. It will count two cells as one cell and the results will be very erroneous. So what is the methodology that only one cell passes at one time is that there is a fluid, okay, sheath fluid on the both sides, okay, so that the central core is compressed. So at any particular point, only one cell is passing through the aperture. So this decreases the problem of recirculation and basically only one cell is counted at one time. So once we are clear with this, let's look at the histograms. So I told you after measuring the number of pulses and the volume, we get a histogram. And now you all know that we will have a histogram, isn't it? So we'll have, let's first look at the RBC histogram. So if you remember your points correctly, Anything which is smaller than 20 femtoliter was counted as platelets. Whereas, okay, anything which is more than 20 femtoliter was RBC. And the higher, the upper uh, the cutoff is about 200 to 250, uh, 200 to 250 uh, femtoliters, okay. 
now now this is very very important so this uh basically gives you an estimated range so anything less than 20 femtoliter is your platelet anything more than that is your rbc okay and always remember the floating range the main range that comes in between these two is usually 60 to 125 femtoliter and on that basis we know that uh, you know the mcv and rdw uh, can be created what is rdw it what is rdw red cell distribution width okay so if you look at this, uh, let's go by examples. So that will be very clear for you to understand. Okay. So suppose this is the RBC histogram. You know anything less than 20 basically is your platelet. Anything more than 20 is going to be RBC. And now what is going to happen is, and I told you the floating range is usually between 60 to 125. So you should get a curve like this. Okay. That is uh, that is the normal curve now suppose look at this hemogram this is a patient now look at this report if you look at the report look at the mcv of the patient so i hope all of you can highlight this point so if you look at the mcv of this patient it is 50.7 so what is the normal mcv guys it's between 80 to 100 isn't it so here the mcv is very very low so definitely the size <coughs> of the RBCs is going to be smaller okay and the volume is going to be smaller so definitely it has a smaller volume so the cells will be shifted to this side so can you see instead of the curve red curve now follow the yellow curve so it is shifted to the left that means this is microcytosis suppose if I draw this curve you're going to tell me the answer so the, the black curve here you're going to tell me the answer what has happened to this so obviously it has shifted to this side so this is your macrocytosis okay so whenever it's more than 100 or 114 100 it's basically going to curve is going to shift to the right and it is macrocytosis so you don't need to look at these values itself you just look at the curve shifted to the left immediately should give you an idea that okay this patient is probably having microcytosis. So this is basically a, might be a case of iron deficiency anemia. We'll go further to identify when to make an iron deficiency anemia or when to make it in thalassemia. So all of you know that who will tell me what are the causes of uh, microcytic hypochromic anemias? Who will tell me the answer quickly, quickly, quickly? iron deficiency thalassemias okay syndroblastic anemias can also show but syndroblastic usually will have uh, biphasic curves okay to have two types of cells okay uh, right and the third one is anemia of chronic disease okay it can be normocytic normochromic or it can be microcytic hypochromic right so now let's look at this uh, rbc parameters so now i told you that looking at the curve okay i said okay this might be a case of iron deficiency anemia why because apart from mcv the second parameter that is going to help me a lot here is your rdw okay so the rdw is going to help me a lot so what is an rdw so we have two type of rdw cv and sd okay so sd means just to measure the volume at the 20 percent height of the graph that is sd whereas if if you create cv that means sd divided by mcv okay so rw cv is basically your sd divided by mcv okay so more the uh, you know more the red cell uh, uh, anisocytosis variation in the size more the rdw okay so patients with iron deficiency anemia have more rdw whereas patients with beta thalassemia traits the rdws usually remain normal so whenever you have a microcytic hypochromic picture here the rbc counts are very less but look at the rdw okay so then uh, so if your rdw is in the normal range okay if your rdw is in the normal range okay then you should think of beta thalassemia trait okay Apart from that, the another clue that helps you in beta thalassemia trait is your RBC count, okay? So, beta thalassemia trait is a hemolytic anemia. So, obviously, the red cells are dying in the periphery. So, bone marrow is basically going to produce more RBCs. So, what is going to happen? Your RBC count is going to go high. So, remember, RBC count high, MCV low, RDW normal should take you towards beta thalassemia trait. And so, the quiz question for you is, there is an index, if you remember, there's an index called as Menzer index. Okay, so Menzer index. So who's going to tell me this Menzer index quickly? Menzer index. Okay, it 
who will tell me this so it's just mcb by rbc okay and if you do this formula and if it comes at less than 13 you suspect beta thalassemia trait okay so it if it is more than 13 it's probably iron deficiency anemia right guys so that's how the coolta simply helps you to quickly just look at the picture and you can differentiate that okay this can be an iron deficiency anemia and this can be a beta thalassemia trait so is everybody clear with this yes okay so once we're clear with this we should know that we have studied about the direct parameters, but we also have calculated parameters, which can be MCV, MCH, MCHC, which can be based upon the formulas, which all of you know. So we'll not go into that detail. Now, let's go to the next flag, guys. Who? What flag is this? This is your RBC flags. So now, once you have seen the normal histogram you should be you should know what all flaggings can come okay now suppose look at this curve okay so normally you studied that curve should be like this okay it should start from the baseline but look at this you can see here it is not starting from the baseline so what can be the cause all of you know below this line is basically 20 femtoliter so it's 20 to 25 femtoliter so less than that should be platelets more than that should be the rbcs so if it is not starting from the baseline that means probably you have very large platelet or platelet clumps coming in and this error is called rl error what is this error called rl error now whereas so this basically occurs whenever there are large platelet comes or whenever platelets are very large in size or the second thing which can be smaller than the rbcs of the size of platelet is schistocytes, fragmented RBCs, okay? So whenever you get an error called RL, okay, and you see that the RBC graph is not starting in the baseline, think immediately that probably we have large platelets which are interfering at that range or probably there are small RBCs, that is schistocytes, which is interfering in that range, okay? Now, let's go to the opposite end of the spectrum. Suppose it doesn't reach the baseline. It just stays up like this. What does that mean? That means something is interfering, okay? So, basically, if you look at the histograms, guys, of the coulter, it's in the, it's in the spectrum. So, first, the smallest cell is going to come. That is platelet, okay? Then the RBC flag is going to come. And more than, bigger than RBC is WBCs are going to come. So just after that, it should be basically your WBC graph. Okay. So when suppose this curve doesn't come here in the baseline, that is something is bigger than the RBCs. Okay. So this usually occurs whenever there is some clumping of the RBCs. So clumping of the RBCs basically can occur either as agglutinates, that is cold agglutinin disease, or as rule. It can be rule, or it can be lymphocytes so we're going to go to the wbc after this okay so the smallest uh, cell okay wbc because you know the culta just measures the nuclear size okay the smallest is wbc so it's going to come so it's cll so whenever it doesn't come here so you should think of cold agglutinin rule or cll okay chronic lymphocytic leukemia that is when you're going to get a ru error now let's look at and other things to identify agglutinates. Now I'm saying, okay, then whether it is CLL or agglutinates, can other clues help? Yes, guys. How? See, clump means this is a big clump. RBCs have former clump. So what is machine going to do? Machine is going to think probably one very big cell is passing. Okay. So it's the MCV of the coulter is going to go very high. But what will happen? Because the cells are clumped together. What will happen to the RBC count? It is going to go low. So, same thing. So, whenever you find that the MCV of the cell is very high, let's say more than 150, and your RBC count is very low, okay, you should immediately think of agglutinates. So, what should you do? Warm the sample at 37 degrees, okay. So, you can warm it. Ideally, it should be for just warm it for 30 minutes, okay, and just see, okay. So, and rerun it. Once you, uh, when you warm it re and rerun it, it's going to improve your, uh, the agglutinates are going to separate from each other and you, when you count, your MCV will fall down and your RBC count will increase. That means probably you're dealing with agglutination, okay? Right. Now, let's look at this. Who is going to tell me this? Now, what is going to happen is in RBC, so this is your platelets and in RBC, you're seeing two peaks here. So, what does this mean? These are multiple peaks. That means either... We have some, you know, microcytic cells and some normocytic cells have started coming. This could be due to post-transfusion or patient has 
IDA, iron deficiency anemia, and Hemne started undergoing treatment. Then also you will get multiple peaks. So let's look at this example and let's see who can identify this quickly. So this is a 22-year-old female and she presents with generalized weakness and fatigue. So if you look at this, all of you can see here. Okay, so although we have uh, uh, not studied this WBC histogram, but you have studied the RBC histogram. So you can see this is the first peak that you're coming getting here is your platelets. And the second peak is this RBC and you can see that it is shifted to the left. So it's probably shifted to the left. Now check your MCV. Yes, your MCV is very low 69. So definitely your, your patient has microcytic hypochromic anemia. Now go to the RDW. RDW is very high. You can see the normal range is 11.5 to 14.5 and it is very high. Okay. And you see the RBC. It is not high. It's low. So probably this is a case of iron deficiency anemia and you will quickly go and advise your iron profile. Now, once we clear with this, now let's go to the next flag, next cell that we should know is platelets. So all of you know the size of the platelet. Basically, it is 2 to 20 femtoliters. So the lower discriminator is set at 2 femtoliters. The higher is set basically at your 30 because anything which is bigger than 30 is definitely going to the RBC. And there is a fixed discriminator which is there at 12 fem femtoliters. Okay. And there should be ascending slope. There should be a descending slope. Now, once you're clear with this, you should understand that any platelet, okay, which is bigger than this 12 femtoliter, so you that platelet are basically large platelets, and this ratio is called as platelet LCR, large cell ratio, and approximately 15 to 35 percent of the platelets can be large in the normal person also. So, a normal PLCR is 15 to 35 percent, and how much is the mean platelet volume? It is about 8 to 12 femtoliters. And just like red cell uh, deviation width, we also have platelet deviation width, okay, which is approximately 9 to 14 femtoliters, okay. So, that's your platelet histogram. Once you clear with platelet histogram, let's look at the platelet flaggings. So, just like RBC, here you saw that the platelet is not starting from the baseline. That means something is there which is not allowing the platelets to start from the baseline. It should start like this, but it is not. So what is smaller than the platelet which can interfere? Something smaller than the uh, platelet is bacteria. So patient with septicemia who have which higher number of bacteria in the blood can give you PL uh, error or there be noise. Machine, you know, you have to set the machine at zero level. If you don't, it has a lot of noise or contaminated reagents or high blank values which can interfere. So whenever you get a PL error, think either there is a bacteria or there's some noise which is coming. So we have to work on it. In contrast, if you see this, that is PU, that is the platelet does not go to the baseline. Instead, it stays up like this. So that means, what does that mean? There must be something which is interfering in the size, isn't it? Normally, this should be the platelet and this should be the RBC. So there should be something which interferes here. Something which interferes here is what? You tell me, what can it be? Same thing, no? Your RL error was the same thing. That is, the RBC was not starting in the baseline. And platelet is not going to the baseline. So, isn't it coming as a same thing? So, this can occur either if you have large platelets or you have small RBCs, schistocytes. So, schistocytes and large platelets will give you PU error. That is what you have to remember. Now, look at this again, just like RBC, multiple peaks. Multiple peaks always means there is either variation in the size of platelet, that is platelet anisocytosis, or it is a recovery after chemotherapy, or there is a platelet aggregates. All this gives you a multiple peaks. So, let's look at this counter, guys. Uh, let's, before going to this counter... Uh, let's, uh, before going to the counter, let's look at this graph, guys. So, this is your WBC histogram, okay? So, when we talk about WBC histogram, so, you know, WBCs are bigger than the RBCs and it's going to come into the third stage, okay? So, now, the smallest cell that we're going to get here is lymphocyte because it has the smallest nucleus. And then, we have all the mixed cells which come in the center. 
which is the largest cell then neutrophil which has 3 to 5 lobes so it's the biggest cell so the largest cell which comes here is your neutrophil the smallest cell which comes here is lymphocyte and anything which is not there in between is your mixed cell so we have monocyte basophils and eosinophils so they come here okay in the mid population so that is how we distribute your wbcs you have to remember that okay now obviously there is a trough which divides these two T1 and T2. It divides these two. And then we have a lower discriminator and we have a upper discriminator, which you should remember. And it should always start from the baseline. That is another point you all have to remember. So this is the smallest population. It's called F1. This is the mid population, which is called F2. And this bigger population is called F3. So let's look at one, his, uh, as I told you, let's look at one Coulter and let's try to interpret it. So if you look at this, so we have three histograms here. Now you have studied all, you know, WBC, RBC and platelet histogram. Okay. So let's come to the RBC histogram, guys. What do you see in the RBC? Yes, very good. It is shifted to the left. So the patient has microcytic hypochromic anemia probably. Right. So now once you know that, that this patient has microcytic hypochromic anemia, ever in your life, what are you going to see? RDW. Okay, so RDW. Yes, so RDW is very, very high. But here also you have to see the RBC count, guys. The next thing you should go and see is your RBC count. So look at the RBC count. It's higher. It's more than 5 million. So obviously, immediately you're going to calculate Menzer index, that is MCV by RBC to differentiate whether this is a beta thalassemia trait or not. But then you should ask me, why RDW is high? So this probably might be a case of beta thalassemia trait with iron deficiency. And that is what it might be. So you have to do iron profile and hemoglobin HPLC both. Now, once you have made one diagnosis, let's go to the next one, okay? So, let's look at this. The second graph is your platelet and your platelets. If you look at your platelet count, it looks normal. It starts at the baseline. It comes to the baseline, okay? It looks pretty normal. Some platelets are smaller in size, so the curve is shifted to the left. And the platelet count appears normal. So, everything is okay with the platelet. Now, let's come to the WBC histogram. So, when you look at the WBC histogram, all of you can see here, you have have this smallest cell lymphocyte you have this neutrophil and this middle peak is very high okay so normally which cells are predominant cells in your body then neutrophils but here you can see the mixed population is very very high so definitely there is a mixed cells which are increased now when you go to the smear because this is three part culture it can give you just three population lymphocyte neutrophil and mixed so you have to go to the smear to see what is increased in the mixed. So once you see the smear, we saw this. So what is this? Eosinophils, guys. So these are all eosinophils bilobed with extensive pink granules. So this patient probably had eosinophilia. So right. So that was a simple case of eosinophilia, which we saw here. Now, Again, let's come to the WBC flags now. Again, suppose now you see, now you know already that we have three, uh, three uh, uh, um, cell population that we have lymphocyte, mixed, and neutrophils <coughs> element. So now, what do you see here? So once you're very, very clear with this, look at this. So first error is that there is an abnormal curve which is coming in front of the lower discriminator. So there is some abnormal curve which is coming. So this probably because there might be a platelet aggregation. Okay. So this might be because of platelet aggregation which can be there. Now, the second error which you see here is that look at this. Okay. So this is not starting at the baseline. It should start at the baseline, but it is starting on the top. So this error already you have studied. This error is always called as WL error. This means that something is there which is in front of the WBC. It has to be RBC. So it can be either unlysed uh, RBCs or nucleated RBCs which are present in the blood. And there can be a lot of platelet clumps or cold agglutinins which can interfere here. So curve does not start at the baseline and it's more than 20% high. Now, let's look at the real curve. So, look at this. Can you see the population here? Lymphocyte, mixed and neutrophil. And it doesn't start at the baseline. So, all of you know that there's something which is present here. Either agglutinate is there or the nucleated RBCs is there. Definitely, we have to check this cell. Check the smear. Whereas, again, the opposite. It does not go to the baseline. It stays up. 
this can occur whenever there are there are wbc aggregate aggregates or extreme leukocytosis then it's called w u error so look at this this is what is a w u error which looks like so now these were the basic three part counters which we went upon just a word about new modern cell counters see modern cell counters you know we have impedance which is there in every counter apart from that we have another principles it can be or their volume conductance uh, conductivity scatter this is called vcs technology which is the uh, typical of beckman coulters we have peroxidase methodology which is advia and we have fluorescence flow cytometry method which is used in sysmix so these are the basic cells which we use so if we talk about vcs okay volume conductivity scatter okay what uh, what does happen in this is here a laser being parts on the cell and you all know that normally whenever the light passes on it you get a forward scatter and you get a side scatter forward scatter is always directly proportional to the size side scatter means according to the granules and then we have another parameter which is called a side fluorescence light so this is on the basis of amount of nucleic acid present okay so this is because there is a dichroic mirror which is present in these machines and it gives you fluorescence light it is based on the nucleic acid content so on the basis of this we have five part coulters now which basically can differentiate the wbc into five major types okay so we use flow cytometries and we can detect all this and we get a we can detect five cells now so you can see here that first cell that comes here remember always the code l m n e okay so earlier three part was 11 now we have l m n e so we have first curve that comes here is lymphocytes then monocytes then neutrophils and then eosinophils comes in the periphery okay and this channel is a differential channel because it's giving you differentials okay so these channels are your differential channels which give you differentials whereas we another we have another channel which is called wbc baso channel in which we have you know side scatter and forward scatter and basically in this channel we differentiate wbc's base base of cells we can differentiate wbc's and base of cells okay this is wbc base of channel okay apart from that we'll just come to another channel which is also called as wnr channel which i'll show you later but let's look at the image before going to anything look at this coulter guys if you look at this coulter rbc is very very clear you can see the rbc curve here it's normal cytic normochromic can you see the platelet here multiple plaques that means there are definitely platelet clumps and you have to see the platelet count of this patient it was 117000 but you can see the number of peaks here so that means there must be some platelet clumps which are there so you will definitely go and see the smear it will be it will show you platelet clumps usually and now what i want you to analyze is basically your this channel here this channel is called as wnr channel okay so in this channel this whole big peak is your wbc it gives you wbc and this channel basically differentiates your wbcs form your nucleated rbcs which can come front and uh, your basophils which can come on the top okay so there can be basophils which come on the top this is called wnr channel then we have we have differential channel and all of you know you have already seen here lymphocyte monocyte neutrophils and eosinophils come here okay and this is the retic channel which we have not studied yet so once we are clear with this let's go to the case here so if you look at this case okay so who we're going to interpret this first is this this is your rbc you can see it's a normal distribution so probably it's a normal it takes some amount of little spike here so some macrocytes are there you can see the platelets here so platelets are going to the like this it's going to the bigger side so it's probably some giant platelets are there okay and you can see the peak also which is coming before rbc which gives you a clue that probably there are some large platelet or platelet clumps okay now when you look at the wbc so there is a single round circle here that, that means there is no nucleated rbcs no basophils okay wbcs are okay but what do you see here now look l m n 
n has become so expanded here so there are probably a lot of neutrophils in this case yes so now once you're seeing this you look at this you see here the neutrophils yes they are increased okay there are approximately 24000 neutrophils in this person's blood that is equivalent to the 84% and total wbc count is 29000 so probably this patient has neutrophilic leukocytosis okay and there is an anemia which is usually normocytic normochromic with some macrocytosis and then uh, uh, of course there are some smaller cells here which are coming which can be either very small microcytes or it can be platelet clumps okay so and just for all those who know the coulter there is a parameter called red he parameter which is a very good parameter for identifying microcyte um, um, hypochromia in the cells because it occurs in the reticulocyte itself so when reticulocyte starts showing decreased hemoglobinization that means definitely they're going to have a microcytic hypochromic cells coming in the blood and this is a very important trigger for very important indicator for uh, um, hypochromia which is coming okay so probably the patient also has some iron deficiency also okay in this person it's developing so after few uh, days if you see and when these reticulocytes become rbcs the hypochromia will become evident and your cells will become microcytic hypochromic also or it can be a dimorphic anemia with both microcytic and macrocytic cells right so this is one of the earliest indicator of your microcytic hypochromic picture so once you're clear with this, so now the, what is the diagnosis of this case? This is a patient who has neutrophilic leukocytosis and at present he has microcytic hypochromic anemia, but he's going to develop microcytic hypochromic anemia also and the platelet count is adequate, right? Now, let's look at this now. So I told you this is a WNR channel. So when WNR you see, there's a clump, big clump, that is a, your WBC and anything in front is your nucleated RBC and anything back on the top is basophiles right so let's look at this case here it will give you an idea so this is a one year old female with anemia now you know this okay all of you uh, have seen this so this patient probably the curve is shifted to the left so this is microcytosis and can you see this this error here yes this is pu error so that means there are some large platelet clumps which are there which are interfering because the platelet curve is not coming to the baseline so this is pu error platelet clumps and if you look at the rbc distribution uh, wbc distribution here what catches your eyes is yes that there is a wbc circle but in front of the wbc circle marked with the red circle is your nucleated rbc so this person has microcytic hypochromic anemia with a lot of nucleated rbcs coming in the blood and this is one year old female and she has a very low hemoglobin of 5.6 that means you should immediately start thinking that this patient might have some hemoglobinopathy and you will immediately send her for hplc immediately send her for hemoglobin hplc let's look at the second case here guys so this is a 45 year old male who has generalized weakness and abdominal heaviness interpret the histogram so if you look at the rbc they are normocytic normochromic no problem there some anemia is there but normocytic normochromic if you look at the platelet count it's again normal okay so platelet count is also normal histograms are normal but what catches your eyes here immediately is that there is a big wbc circle but there are some some if you highlight here there are some nucleated rbcs which are also coming here apart from that you can also see some peak on the top so what is this this is basophils so probably this patient has some basophils also coming some nucleated rbc and a big wbc clump and if you see the picture of this okay or uh, if you look at the uh, distribution of this you can see that it is uh, so all of you know l m n e okay so what do you see here is that there are some precursors of the neutrophils which are coming and there are some precursors of the monocyte lymphocytes which are coming and it's going in the top like this pattern okay so definitely there is some neutrophilic precursors which are increased in this okay along with basophilia and leukocytosis what should be a differential? So you check your findings. Yes, there is leukocytosis. Yes, there is neutrophilic leukocytosis shift coming in with some amount of basophils also coming in. So Ig is your immature granulocytes which are coming in. This is probably a case of chronic myeloid leukemia. Okay, so this is probably a case of chronic myeloid leukemia which you should know. 
Whereas if you look at this case here again, if this case, what does it, what does, what catches your eye is, so instead of the curve that you saw previously, here you can see this is lymphocyte and here only monocytes are getting increased. There's no increase in the neutrophils. So probably monocyte is going in the abnormal peaks here. And again, there have nucleated RBCs are there. There are, um, and your counts are increased. Your WBC is very high, but here the predominant peak that you're coming is in the monocytic region, which is going into the immature stage also. And the history is also very suggestive. This patient has gum bleeding, loss of appetite. Immediately, you should think of monocytic leukemia. Okay, acute monocytic leukemia. Now, let's look at this curve again. Okay, now instead of the curve which we have seen here, look at this here. Here, you are getting a peak only in the lymphocytic region. Okay, so there is a peak in the lymphocytic region. So, their WBC count again is very high. And here, the region, the peak region is only in the lymphocytic region like this. Okay, and... If you look at the platelet, patient also has a thrombocytopenia and you can see multiple peaks here. Okay, so there are multiple peaks. So probably either patient is transfused or he has agglutinates. Okay, and the RBCs are normocytic normochromic with some macrocytosis. So whenever you see such lymphocytes only which are going up, within uh, history, he, history is very typical. This is 65 year old asymptomatic male and you see only lymphocytes coming in here like this. This is probably a case of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. This is probably a case of chronic lymphocytic leukemia. So these are the basic things that you all have to know, guys, uh, which, which you should know. Just to conclude, there's one more channel which I would like to tell you is Retic Channel because your talk is incomplete without Retic Channel. So you know, when we talk about RBCs, we also should know about reticulocytes and whenever the reticulocytes are getting produced so you know apart from rbcs we have lfr mfr and hfr that is low fluorescence mid fluorescence and high fluorescence okay so before your wbcs come so these fluorescence comes in okay so these are fluorescence and these rbcs are differentiated from the platelet which come below and in between the platelet and rbcs are some fragments okay so this channel is called reticulocyte channel normally majority of the uh, reticulocytes are LFR, low fluorescence, that is 86 to 98, um, 97, 98%, whereas your HFRs are very less, approximately 1.4%, okay? So, normally, what do we do is, we quickly go, uh, okay, so we basically go and count the mid and high fluorescence, you know why? Because we know that mid and high should not be more. So, when we count both of them, okay, this gives you uh, some of, uh, okay, so we count the mid and high and we divide it by the low uh, fluorescence intensities reticulocyte <coughs> this is called reticulocyte index okay and this reticulocyte index normally if you talk about females it's about 1.1 to 15.9 if you talk about male it is 1.5 to 13.7 so whenever you talk about reticulocyte count it comes as retic and irf comes separate so i hope you understand irf this is immature reticulocyte fraction what is immature reticulocyte fraction if you just count the mid and high Okay, and you don't divide it by lower. That is immature reticulocyte fraction. So you basically just count these two. These two, you just count mid and high. This is your immature reticulocyte fraction. Okay, so this is IRF and the IRF values are what are important. So they give you that how much is the IRF, that is how much is the mid and high fluorescence. Okay, right. So once you're clear with this, let's look at one case here. So let's see if you can identify. This is a 15-year-old male who has acute abdominal pain and fever. And what catches your eye immediately is red cells are normal here. Platelets are basically borderline. And if you see the distribution of WBC, it is also normal. But look at this reticulocyte here. So reticulocytes are actually completely distributed. So there's a lot of production with the bone marrow because your immature reticulocytes are also getting increased. That is high fluorescence also and mid fluorescence also is increased. So look at the reticulocyte count. It's very, very high. So probably this is a case of hemolytic anemia. This is probably a case of hemolytic anemia. So how to come to which type of hemolytic anemia? Obviously, smears help. But look at this case. Case again so same thing here there is a lot of reticulocytes which are coming here so the patient has reticulocytosis but what catches your eye immediately it should catch your eye what is it your mcv is very high and your rbc count is very low that means probably there are agglutinates which are there and this agglutinate is counted by your counter as one cell. So it is counting as a very low rbc count with a very high mcv so this is probably a case of 
cold agglutinin disease. So what you should what you should do, you know that already. Warm the sample and then run it, and you will know that. Okay. Now coming to the last case here, guys. You're going to make a diagnosis of this. Let me see how many of you can make it. This is a 10-year-old boy with paler and petechiae, and you have to interpret it. So you can see here there are no reticulocytes coming here. Can you see here? That means the reticulocyte count is very low. Your absolute reticulocyte count is also very very low. So this patient is having low reticulocyte count. Along with that, your WBC, hemoglobin, and platelet all are very low. And if you look at that, your neutrophil count is also very low. So if I am saying it's a 10 year old boy it should have you know more uh, neutrophils but here the neutrophil counts are going down your absolute neutrophil count is only 540 so a uh, pancytopenia with a uh, non-severe neutropenia with the reticulocyte count going down you should always think of aplastic anemia so looking at the picture itself here you can say and looking at the culta here itself say the predominantly lymphocytes are the predominant population this is a case of aplastic anemia probably and you have to do the bone marrow examination so with that we finish today's session and i hope you would have understood something guys and do let me know your feedbacks you can follow me on your on my telegram youtube facebook and instagram so instagram page is dr vandana pathology which you can follow and i'll be very happy to get feedbacks from you and do let me know if you uh, wish me to take uh, some uh, any other session or if you've not understood anything i'll be happy to explain you back again thank you so much guys Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. You mentioned that the topic was sort of hard and hard to navigate, although it is very fascinating. But ma'am, I'm sure undergraduates watching are very grateful for you for having break, broken down the topic in a way that's comprehensive and clear. It was really informative and valuable for us, ma'am. Thank you so much, dear. I uh, I was thinking that I'm taking more time than the usual. I should actually decrease the uh, time of the talk, but I'm so sorry for taking more time. I'm so sorry for that. Absolutely, ma'am. We're grateful, actually. We're grateful, ma'am for the efforts and everything that you did for us ma'am thank you so much dear thank you any final comments ma'am should be done through the session point. So, yeah, just the last comment is interpretation of hemograms is very essential, guys. Look at more and more hemograms. You'll become more and more experts in understanding it. And every hemogram tells you a different story. So do try to understand and learn from every hemogram you see. That's the last thing. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll conclude the session. Bye.